introduce our guest here, Thomas Queter. Uh, bring him on. How you doing, friend? Oh, good, bad, ugly, libertarian, right? There you <laughs> go. Yeah, that's the way it is. Uh, it's so, been a heck of a week for me. So let's hear, let's hear about yourself. What is it uh, you're running? You you were just hearing us having a nice discussion about the Libertarian parties and the, uh, how things are rigged. And uh, we touched on a little bit of everything. So you, you want to weigh in on those topics where, as you were listening before you get to yourself? or? Well, the Libertarian Party in New York is new, very new. And we're drawing from both sides, including other third parties and independents. And there are a lot of different opinions. And that's going to come with some controversy. That's going to come with some conflict. And my prerogative has been to try and hold the discussion, make people talk to each other, make people understand where they're coming from on all sides. And when you can succeed at doing that, you can do exactly what you were talking about with our presidential nominees. You know, they talk to each other, figure it out, come to a consensus, and, and find something that works. Because if you can't find something that works, what good are we doing? Right. Uh, so my campaign is focusing on listening to specific groups who are being vocal and taking action and hearing everybody out. Um, I've been loosely involved with the two-way movement here in Chenango County as chairman of the county organization. And well, actually, I take that back, not chairman, chair. We did gender neutralize our language and the rules. Uh, that just seemed appropriate. Beyond that, you know, infiltration really is a thing. I, I heard you guys talking about that. You know, other parties trying to put people in our party to take over it. Yeah. And some of that has happened, and I've been personally involved in keeping out the nefarious actors who seek to hijack our name and to seek to claim to have our principles when they do not. Um, and that, that's important, right? You have to play this both ways. You have to be accepting, and you have to be willing to say, well, look, you're not following our principles. Right. You're obviously against them. So to that note, when that happens, we need to do what we need to do. Yeah, you gotta you gotta rally enough people around to to expose them, right? Right. Which, um, in regards to a certain congressional district of which I I am living in, um, that's exactly what we did. The the other county organizations and I come together, and you know we approach the situation reasonably first, and when a certain individual who did not act reasonably um, tried to be empirical. Right? We are the Empire State of all freaking yeah. things. Um, we want to be Rome and fall. I don't know what that's about. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he was acting extremely empirical and he was trying to force his hand over all the other counties in the district. And so we got the state committee involved and this gentleman was censured. And then he resigned. And, and that's the way it should work. We follow our rules. We follow our procedures. We adopted them. If we discover that our rules are not adequate, it is for our prerogative to change them appropriately, not to break them, as he was suggesting. And I saw that in Orlando, right? Uh, the people who had any controversy over the hybrid, it wasn't about whether or not we allowed them to participate. It was about how we allowed them to participate to make sure it was legitimate and couldn't be argued and fought after the fact. And that's important. And I understand that. I, I went there gung-ho thinking, I, I got to get everybody to support this because there's a lot of back and forth about it. And, and some people are agreeing, some people are not. And, you know, I didn't have a nationwide delegates list, so I couldn't tell who was actually going to be able to vote on this. And I was amazed. I was amazed when I got there. Um, in some form or another, everyone there supported the hybrid option. And, and we ended up with it. And, you know, personally, it was extremely difficult for me to get to Orlando. I, I put myself at, at big risk. I, I'm at respiratory risk, for one. You know, COVID-19 is a real thing, but it's more real for those who have pre-existing yeah. conditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a hard decision for me. You know, I know what it's like to not be included. I know what it's like to be left out. And I didn't want to see that happen to all the delegates who 
for government rules, right? And we weren't doing this over personal safety as much as the fact that uh, we would be punished by our own state governments in certain places, New York in particular. Um, wow. We, we can't expect people to accept government force to support a party that's against government force. It's a little contradictory. Contradictory, um, yeah, exactly. So it was my prerogative to go there and make sure that happened. And I was very, very glad to realize that I didn't really have to do much. Uh, everybody was in support of it in one way or another. And, and that's the right thing. Um, and, and in fact, I, I would go on further and say that we should absolutely think about having this as a contingency because as libertarians, we're very familiar with government force and how they act. And you guys were just talking about it with ballot access and moving to goalposts and trying to hijack the party, I and mean, that's all government for us. We need to be prepared for that. If that's what we're against, that's absolutely what we need to be prepared for. Right. And to that note, I think the hybrid or remote entirely, if necessary, option needs to become some kind of permanent contingency plan that we can choose to follow when necessary. And otherwise, we're literally just laying down and saying, okay, government, do what you want. Is that right. libertarian? Not it's really not. libertarian at all. Um, yeah. so, you, you know, the, the, the party has some problems and, and I ran into some yesterday, actually. Um, so we have some, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Um, we, we have, uh, what's called the people's protection March going on around here. And, um, if you watch the media, which I don't, but I am informed on it, um, the, <sighs> I can't stand mainstream media. They take something like Black Lives Matter and they vilify it. And yeah. the people who care about it may not be associated with the direct organization, say Black Lives Matter, and everybody thinks, oh, well, they're terrible people. And, and, and that's not the way it works, particularly not in central New York where I am. These are independent local groups with initiatives. Um, and to that note, um, there was a counter protest at yesterday's um, People's Protection March in Norwich. Um, and there was a handful of people, and most good libertarians know these people. They'll fly the Blue Lives Matter right next to the Gadsden flag. Oh. Yeah, a little, hip, hip, uh, a little hypocrisy going on there, right? Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. tread on me, but we want more. Cops more treading police, on me. Yeah, more police state. I've right, seen that right. the truck, at the back of trucks and stuff. Laugh every time. Right. And I'm not a cop hater either. I have a handful of friends who are cops. And and years ago, I learned that, you know, if you get a little whiskey in them, they'll tell you they don't like bad cops either. Right? right. A lot of people sign up for the job. They want to do the right thing. And, you know, the problem comes down in the hierarchy and the rules and the orders. Right? Um, if you have a good job and you have a family to support... And your boss says, well, now you have to do this or you're out, right? I mean, if you don't do your job, you're going to get fired. Yeah. Um, who, uh, who's not going to think about their children first? Yeah, that's true. I mean, but at some point, you got to take responsibility that you're you're participating in a system. And even if, if you're not doing something to the bad cop or turning in the bad cop because you fear for losing your own family's protection and everything – you should be starting to look for something other means of, you know, if that's the way you feel, you should be looking for another line of work. You shouldn't just. And you actually see that. You, life like you that. do see that. You do see that. You see uh, a good number of cops. Um, oh, going yeah, to yeah, private yeah, that's security. true. That's true. Of course you do. You always see people. You'll see cops having good conscience, even making videos about it and, and quitting the force. And but you also see cops quitting the force because they can't get away with stuff anymore. Did you see that when the. Uh, when that 80 year old man got pushed over Wonder. and there was a bunch of police. Yeah, that's horrible. That, that's that excellent. Be me, you, know? Well, you know, if they leave because they can't abuse their power, then. Well, no matter why they leave, that's fine. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead and get out of here then. You, yep. you know what? I would say I'm only going to add one thing. You're never allowed back, period. <laughs> Have a nice day. You know? Right. And that is another problem too, because um, there are studies and statistics that show that bad, bad cops will move to a new state or a new district or a new county and the record doesn't follow as well as it should, and they might get hired um, despite a bad record. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, that... 
So what what uh what district are you specifically are you running for? You want to go ahead and advertise your page and where people can contact you? Well, I'm running for District 52 in New York. That's Broome, Tioga, half of Shenango, and a little bit of Delaware counties. Um, you can find my website at tomfor52.com. Nice, pretty picture of me looking miserable there, huh? <laughs> <We're good. laughs> I, I suppose maybe a little more stern and solemn. Um, I am a little miserable today. I got rained on yesterday, and I've, I've, uh, I've felt like I was 80 since I was 8. My condition causes uh, arthritis and inflammation and the like. And so getting out there and doing these things, it causes me to suffer. But you know what? Doing it anyhow. You power through it because it's that important. You know, that's a... That's why it do. absolutely is. Actually, when, when I entered the race, I knew full well that it was going to be hard to maintain disability services and, and health care that I actually need. Um, I shouldn't need them. My community should be able to provide them. But in the current state of things, I won't survive without them. Right. And, and I went into this knowing that. Um, but that's how passionate I am about it. Sure. I, I tend to keep an even keel. Right. My emotions are, are pretty leveled. Uh, and on that note, um, there was a little bit of controversy. Uh, yesterday at the protest, we had a counter protest by those libertarians, supposedly. Oh, yeah, the, the waving both flags. So, what happened there? Yeah, and, and you know, they have a right to say what they want to say, but that was the wrong place. It was not their protest. They didn't organize it. You know, I mean, you know, honestly, if you expect to be heard and not shut down, there's a time and a place, right? And, and you know, I, I don't think the other side would have done that in an overwhelming majority of another protest that's against them. That wouldn't work. Um, and, and here's what happened, right? There, there was some conflict and there was some controversy. And, uh, you know, I actually tried to diffuse it. I, I tried to talk to both sides. As I said, that's what I did in the Libertarian Party often yeah. enough, almost every day. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I, I got there and I was between them and there was a crowd on both sides. Um, the one side was up on the steps and being in a wheelchair, I, I couldn't actually get close enough to speak to them well. Um, and, you know, one gentleman grabbed another man, gentleman's picket sign and threw it. And, you know, that was dangerous for me because after that, they all, you know, did what people do. The chest puffed out and they yeah, came mom. together, right? And I was right in the middle and I have one of the lowest bone densities you'll find on earth still being alive um, actually uh my orthopedic surgeon said i was the most um brittle or, or had the least bone density of anybody he'd ever seen up until like a year or two ago um yeah and, and i'm willing to put myself in that situation so think about that you know think about what it takes to know your skull is as brittle as an eggshell and to go in there and to do that wow. um the fortunate thing about that is that i'm used to doing that I'm familiar with the situation. I've, I've been diffusing conflicts all my life. That's just my nature. You're not supposed to sit there and just let bad things happen. That, that's not right. And mm -hmm. if you can talk it out, talk it out. And, and that's what I attempted. Um, my, uh, my campaign staff were probably much more afraid for me than I was afraid. I was not entirely afraid. Um, I don't really have that fear reaction anymore. You're probably um, just alert. Knowing alert, yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, situational alertness is actually very common in, yeah. in those with disabilities because you have to be. You have to be, um, yeah. But the issues, right, were interesting, right? I mean, they were just, today is a funny day, right? This year is a funny year. And when I say funny, I mean off, right? Things are wrong. Things are bad everywhere. Everyone is mad. Everyone is afraid and everyone is going through what I consider to be situationally psychological oppression. Everybody's got a problem with what's going on. Our economy is suppressed. That hurts everyone. In New York, our healthcare system is suppressed. That also hurts everyone. Um, racial tensions and militarization of the police. Obviously, that's going to cause more controversy. You add this all together, and you can't find a person who's not upset, right? I mean, we're libertarians. We see it all the time. Everybody's always upset. Um, and it, it, uh, it makes me think. We're in a situation where people are trying to be heard, and everyone's angry. 
Do we expect rational behavior in that situation? Think sure. about humans, right? Um, and I was on, I was actually on Ken Armstrong's podcast last night and we discussed this and this is actually tactics that they use as psychological warfare in other countries. Our military uses this in other countries for war. And here we are seeing the two parties do that to us through the media and then we pick up on it. We do it to each other and we need to be better than that. We need to rise above that. And to that note, um, some of the uh, policies I'm seeking are to abolish mandatory minimum sentencing. That's ridiculous. Uh, we are individuals in individual situations, and sometimes we make mistakes. And, and let's face it, uh, an awful lot of us don't need that minimum sentencing. We could yeah. walk away with that, and slap on the minimum. wrist, and learn our yeah. lesson, right, if yeah. necessary. What are you drinking there? Oh. This is uh, it's just my big canteen stainless steel. It's alkaline water. I make my own alkaline water. I uh, nice. email Helen Yaple. She taught me how. I, uh, I I keep myself alkaline for diet. It helps a lot. I'm gonna go ahead and drop a uh, a, a notice for Helen's holistic hints on YouTube. That's where you can find out how to make alkaline water. It's basically simple: stainless steel container, uh, half a lemon, half a lime, some orange, some apples stuff like that and a mineral rock but you can check that video out anyways back to you i apologize i, know why I did so that. i also want to eliminate civil asset forfeiture um yeah yeah they shouldn't be able to take your property over crime that's that's unconstitutional yeah absolutely right. you, have, you have a right to property um and uh I, i'm in favor of police body cameras we've seen this help okay. identify those who abuse their power we've seen this help keep them accountable and in new york recently um my opponent supported a bunch of bills to give the police more power and to increase minimum sentencing for certain things um after 50-a here in new york was repealed which is basically qualified immunity that's gone um there's still some hiccups it's hard to get that information that we're supposed to be allowed to have access to now. But I think that'll come through. You know, it, when we change the system, it takes a little time to work it out. And uh, obviously, certain actors are going to fight against that in whatever way they can, whether it's legitimate or not. Right. Um, so, you know, that, that, that was a win, you know. So to everybody who voted to repeal 50-A and struck down all the bills that he sponsored or co-sponsored to basically retaliate against that kudos good job yeah, absolutely um, sadly none of them were libertarians but this is new york <laughs> um yeah you know and, and we do need to overhaul the police training we, we, we do a lot of teaching them how to hurt people and how to take their stuff and we don't really do a lot of how to teach them to interact with the community to build those relationships and those friendships i mean i it, all my life almost everybody i know the minute the minute the cop drives by everybody's alert everybody knows right everybody thinks well mm -hmm. everybody's doing something <laughs> right, right. Never know who is after. everything illegal yeah um yeah we you know, just, and the war on drugs is a huge about that thing. A earlier today how basically anything i didn't mean to cut you off but i want it as a point to that uh basically anything like we live out here in the middle of nowhere but i can almost guarantee you that if the federal government wanted to they could probably find like a plant or something on this property that they could file into their illegal category and bust us on you know what i mean like it's so ridiculous i don't know anything specific but you can get the point i'm making so many things are illegal that when they come around that fear is pumped because they don't know who who's who's the one that's in trouble who are they after you know even if they're even if they go to the neighbor's house you're still scared because you don't know if maybe that neighbor lied to them for some reason because he hates me because i didn't mow his lawn or something and he tells them i was part of it even though it had complete fallacy people you know you've heard of uh people getting swatted people calling the cops on people for no absolutely no reason and having that brought upon them we got to train against that too it's, sorry continue go ahead and in new york you know we have the red flag laws too 
So you, you, you can do nothing wrong and get red flagged. And okay. they will come bust down your door and take your guns. I couldn't even um, imagine that. Yeah, well, I live in a whole different world than that. I couldn't even imagine. And, you, you know, I, I counsel addicts because I know them. Uh, they're in my community. I grew up with them. And I don't see our systems helping. I see those addicts who are able to avoid arrest, jail, prison, and state systems they do better they move on they 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 figure it out and you know maybe they smoke some marijuana maybe they uh just stop it, it all depends on the individual with drugs right i mean different people have different levels of addiction to different drugs um some people can pick up and drop heroin i've met them it's amazing and crazy um but mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I mean it's it's interesting and, and, and the, the problem here is that we have these blanket regulations thinking that this one thing works for everybody and you know you probably wouldn't like being in my wheelchair but i still do <laughs> right. you see what i'm saying um yeah. and you know the the best way to do that is to decriminalize drugs um when we do that we free up an awful lot of money to where we can offer more choices to the addict to be helped. Um, everything from medical marijuana, psilocybin, kratom. I mean, it's out there. We know it. We, you know, a hundred years ago, we had midwives that knew this stuff right. here in the States. Our, our doctors came to your house and they had marijuana in their bag. Um, and, and now, now we're just left to suffer and deal with whatever the government thinks we should do. And that, that's not helping people. That's actually increasing the recidivism. Um, because, you know, one of the best places in New York to get drugs is if you're locked up in jail or prison. Hmm. That's crazy. The access is there, right? I mean, if you're trapped in a place with drugs and what else are you going to do? People are going to do drugs. I, I know so many people that had to come out of jail to get clean. Wow. That's crazy. You know, um, and, you know, in, in my district, there's an interesting divide. Um, I think it's two thirds or more of the district is rural and agricultural as far as the land use. Um, the population is more spread out, a little lower per town and it's unaddressed we need to grow hemp it's a versatile product it, it can be made to so many things it rejuvenates the land and we're not letting it be freely grown it costs a lot of money and favoritism through politics to get a permit to grow hemp from which we can get things like cbd which are already fully legal as products um why aren't we capitalizing on that that's like saying I have this pile of gold over here, but I'm not going to spend it when I need it. Yeah. I mean, are, are we are we choosing to starve to death when we have the resources to, to eat? Does that make sense? No, 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 no. We could replace everything oil with hemp easily. I mean, we don't have to replace everything, but we literally could replace everything that uses oil with hemp. And it would be so much cleaner, so much more efficient, so much everything it replenishes the soils it i mean i mean there's a it, it is really mind-blowing how many benefits come from that and it's really a crime that it's not uh taken advantage of i mean it's literally Absolutely. it blows my mind I don't, I don't understand why but i have a question i'm not really um uh versed very well in the inner workings of like you're running for state senate uh I mean, I know obviously you're running to be a senator. So let's say you won for what are, you know, let's just play with the idea for a little while. You win state Senate day one. Like, what do you start doing? Do you have to wait until they're, they're in some kind of session or do you start writing a bill of your own? Or do you like, what do you start doing immediately action wise to start implementing ideas like this hemp idea that we're having or that you have? The first thing I do is find a podium and call a press conference, and I can tell you why. 
um, our state has an office of advocacy for those with disabilities on the books. And you're, you're, you're going to balk when you hear this. Everybody does. Uh, it ceased to function when the Justice Center reorganized. The Justice Center reorganized and got rid of advocacy for the disabled. It's just a piece of paper now. Um, and, and that's insane. And I've actually helped other people in other states where they have something akin to that, and it works. Um, I, I'm a disability advocate, and I've been reaching out to individuals, usually through the Internet, to help them as best as I can. And I was dealing with a gentleman, an African-American gentleman in Chicago. And he had a home health aide, and they were not getting along, right? Do you really want someone coming into your house when you can't get along with them, right? And, and technically, he has the right to request a different person. Right? That's his home. And that disability aide told him that he would have his services removed, which is not a power he has. He was lying. Yep. Talk about government abuse, you know, uh, systemic. It, it's, yep. Um, and all I had to do was refer him to the, I believe it was a legal office at the state level in Illinois. And you know, I, I ran into him in one of these Facebook disability groups, and you know, he's complaining post after post after post. He was in severe distress and had multiple physical and cognitive disabilities. And, you know, I'm going to clarify the cognitive. He may have just not gotten an education because of being black and disabled. That's common. Um, but I, I got him referred to that office, and the, the complaining stopped. I don't know what he did. I don't know what happened. I just gave him a phone number. That's all it took. Anybody can do that. Um, and, you know, you think about that. It works in Illinois. It works in Chicago, Illinois. It works among minorities with disabilities in Chicago, Illinois. But New York says, nope, 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 nope. We're not going to help you. I mean, really? So... It's crazy. One of my main initiatives is going to be working with the legislature to make sure we reinstate that office in a sensibly functional manner. Um, our governor makes sweeping health care and disability policies without any advocacy, without hearing the needs of those with disabilities. And the New York Assisted Independent Living Association, the nonprofit, screams about this every year and nobody listens. Um, but they don't have a Senate podium, do they? Right. And if I can get one, I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. And to that note, that this is not a this is not a minority issue, right? It sounds like disabilities. Well, that's just a few people. It's actually 20 percent of the population at any given point. Um, by the time of age 65, 42.8 or per, or more percent of the population has a disability. And the longer you live, the more likely you are to live a period of time with a disability. And that means your rights can be taken away. Mm -hmm. The control of your life can be taken away. Mm -hmm. Health and medical decisions can be made for you. I've been through that myself. Um, it's not right. It's wrong. <laughs> it's more wrong than people realize. Um, mm -hmm. People who are able-bodied don't ever think about this until it's them. And I can tell you, if you are fortunate enough to not die suddenly of an accident or a heart attack or something to that degree, you will live a period of life with a disability. Um, those who adamantly thought I was wrong about this when I was younger are meeting that age, and some of them are coming to me for help. Um, we also restrain our hospitals. Uh, first of all, we tax our health care that we pay for with taxes. So there's that. That kind of sounds like an inefficient system, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Eventually that money dries up. And when I was forced under Medicare at age 34, um, the level of coverage that I got was reduced. And I couldn't get the wheelchair that I needed to pursue a full and happy life. And in fact, what they did offer would have injured me to sit in for a prolonged period of time. And that's a situation that puts someone like me to the bed. When someone with a severe disability is put to the bed, 
that's not fun. That that that's a slow death, and that that that's what our healthcare is saying. The minute you can't pay taxes, the minute you deserve a slow and horrible death. No. So you know we can go after these taxes, but uh, you know those are all issues that speak well. And here's the issue that doesn't speak well, which we hit on with hemp. Our economy is so restrained. It's so hard to start a business. And we just lost 100,000 small businesses in this state alone through the COVID legislation. Now, the emergency powers legislation, to correct myself there. I've always had a great life because I live in a small community where I have a lot of relatives and people will support me in ways that the government does not, which means almost everything. <laughs> and we are removing the power of our communities to be able to do that. If you have less money, you have less to share. If you have less food, you have less to share. If you have lesser housing, you don't have an extra room to offer somebody for a night, for a week, or maybe even a year, right? And most people would do that for somebody. Right. Family member, at least. Sure. And as we further remove our ability and power to do this, then we are completely reliant on government systems that we know are failing, that we know don't work. The solutions are not there. Um, and to that note, we need to offer solutions. Medical marijuana in this state right now is heavily restrained by taxation. The permits to, to sell it are limited. Um, mm. Me personally, if I were to use medical marijuana, I would have to drive at least an hour, I think, to find a shop that I could purchase it from. Oh, Transportation is not very easy for me. In fact, my campaign staff about has a heart attack every time we use my van because the lift's not very safe. Kind of oh. looks like I'm sitting on a diving board. Um, yeah, right. And, and DJ is uh, in a state that also is uh, he, he's running for an office as well. And he lives in a state that's not medically legal. It is literally a hey, CJ. Good to see you, my friend. He's running. Yeah. Like I said, he's running for office again, too. Why don't you guys uh, talk? Oh, to no, we, we've met. Office. How are you doing, sir? Not too bad. How are you doing? Good. Glad to see you on the broadcast, man. I saw your name on the list and I thought, oh, this is going to be good. And man, even. I wish Adam was here to to have been part of this conversation, man, because you brought so much to the table today. But as Jim mentioned, and I do have a question, so this is this is leading to a question, sir. Um, I do live in a state in South Dakota where the Queen of Meth, Governor Christy Noam, has uh, declared us all on meth by proclamation. I much rather would prefer, as a veteran, to use medical cannabis, and I have zero access to. As most know, just 12 miles north of me is the great state of North Dakota. And there, I'm considered a war hero. Thank you for your service, CJ. Don't take those pills. They could kill you. And down here, I would be considered a felon if I even wanted to uh, use that as my medicine. So uh, I can relate to a lot of the access issues for sure. Uh, what, what, but my question is, is what is your opinion of Governor Christy Noam and states that have this ignorance on this topic, because I can't say it nicely enough. Uh, so, what is what would be your thought to these states that are so far behind on this topic, and 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 being like as a disabled veteran, uh, I can say, well, what are really my disability rights in this to my own choice of medicine? I right, um so. Obviously, the people who could benefit most from marijuana do have a disability, and are veterans. I know plenty of them. But the real point here is it's not just one group's right. It's everyone's right. Um, it's a product. We can grow it. We can sell it. It's a soothing agent for those who have high stress. People who work very hard often want to come home and blow off a little steam or just relax. And do we want them using um, math or even liquor? Or do we want them using medical marijuana? I mean, do we want them to get worked up and, and have emotional issues? Or do we want them to get calm and take a nap? Yeah, no, I always, uh, when I, I'm, I always have to preface with, I'm a seaweed smoker. Uh, when I see weed, I smoke weed, but I here in South Dakota, I don't see weed. So, uh, you know, I, I honestly, 
to me, it's it's a huge issue. And I know you're running for Senate and I'm running for Senate. And another thing you spoke to in this interview is what would you do uh, as a senator? And I think that you would agree with me that we would be able to sponsor legislation that fixes problems. And would, which would then draw media attention to said problem in a appropriate way for a government to redress a grievance of the people. So wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, CJ. Oh. Do you mean to tell me that increasing the power of the police and increasing the minimum sentences that that's not going to help the people? And no, it would <laughs> certainly help the people for sure. And that's where, where to me, I go. You know, also with like access issues, I would sponsor a bill. In our state, we do have a hope, a prayer that the people of this Trumplican state go, yeah, we can we can have uh, medical and recreational cannabis because we do have a, a constitutional amendment for uh, recreational cannabis and medical cannabis and our right to consume it if we so choose, which then you get into the stalling of the election and it makes you go, hmm, like, what, what, what again do we do to, you know, point all this front and center in a way that, you know, it's not partisan. It's, it's, it's not just a party issue. When you hear Trump and Biden both against cannabis in certain forms, does it throw you off as a candidate when you're, when you're having to tell adults that are adults allegedly that, well, no, it's my body, my right to choose. You should be able to have all your freedoms all the time. And you say these things to them, but what does that get you in return? So I'm kind of curious to, how do you combat the ignorance, I guess, in, in your campaign? And what advice do you have for someone like me who constantly deals with the, I mean, you're in New York. I, I'd assume you deal with more Democrat government, uh, form of government than Republican, I assume. Uh, yes, no. Uh, my district is actually more largely red. Okay, but I mean, on the state level, though, you're still a blue uh, state. Uh, absolutely. You know, we were talking about hemp earlier. If I want to, I, I, I'd like to backtrack to that. Just yeah, go ahead. Bit. Um. You know, Jim mentioned that uh, hemp can replace many things, including fossil fuels. And New York's Green Energy Program uh, wants to put in a lithium-ion battery incinerator where people live next to children's ballparks across the road for a grocery store, uh, as well as uh, the 675-foot-tall windmills full of petroleum products that likely will get turned off soon after they're built, just like most of the other windmills in this state. Um, and they're spending our money on that instead of letting us grow hemp. Yeah. So, I mean, again, what's your advice to a kid to me on the partisan politic? And, you know, what, what do we actually well, do? As you know, candidate? we got to talk about the reality. We got to talk about the numbers. And we got to talk about how it's always been. Marijuana and hemp has been around for a very, very long time. It's been medicine for thousands of years. We have a very well-developed um, cannabinoid system, right? Our body reacts to it. And, and I can speak to that personally. There was a study um, that came out of another country that showed that CBD in particular, and there was another one that showed the THC also assisted, increased the interconnectivity of collagen type 1 in healing bone. Collagen type 1 acts like the mesh and rebar that you might see going into concrete, like when they put up a pillar they cage it first. Um, or when they lay a um, patio, they, they lay rebar and wire mesh first. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the structural part. That would be collagen type 1 in your bone. And so what CBD in particular actually does is increase that connectivity. And my genetic condition causes a decreased connectivity of collagen type 1. Correct. <laughs> so, so, so you would actually truly benefit and you can actually – scientifically explain it to people. Now, I once tried to explain what a cannabinoid system is to a Native American comedian who I admire and respect and love and have known of my whole life. Uh, and, and he's a legend out here in South Dakota. And I tried to explain a cannabinoid to him while he was live on set. I don't recommend doing that. But, uh, you know, there is a disconnect in the fundamental want to understand the other side's opposition and, and wanting to learn why I, I fundamentally disagree with you. I think that something like THC and CBD would help yourself, myself, and anybody that chooses to use it for whatever reason they need it for. I mean, to me, it's a little silly to go, well, my, my president and my presidential candidate think it's bad, so I think it's bad. And that's where, again, I'm, I'm hoping 
that you know the people at least of my state will will make the adult decision and and it, there's a bigger issue to it i mean it's it's not just your your right to a plant that you want to have some weird attachment to racist slanderous history of what it actually is you know i call it cannabis for a reason i call it you know uh you know what it properly is a medicine and then I ask people, and, and I honestly, whenever I've met a Republican out here in South Dakota that is against cannabis, my first answer is, is well, do you want me to take the pill that'll make me kill myself? And and their, nor and their normal answer is, is, well, no, CJ, I don't really want you to kill yourself. Well, then why do you care what medicine I choose to use to heal me? So right. you well, know, a lot of uh, a lot of psych meds are methamphetamines. Well, yeah, I mean, so again, the. And, and again, you, you speak to uh, opioid addiction. Uh, Which you know, I can. I, 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 I mean, absolutely. Well. I, I've heard you speak about it before, too. Um, you know, I, I was in a war zone that protected poppy fields that got shipped to the United States on pharmaceutical contracts. Like, you can't tell me the government didn't play a role in the opioid crisis. And then, you know, I yeah, cycle. Well, since, since we've been in Afghanistan, the production of opium fields over there is up by 40 times. Oh, yeah, because we have pharmaceutical contracts we're protecting over there. So, you know, and that's and their big the agriculture. And we have to is safe for kids. Oh, yeah, you know, let's just uh, give our kids some, uh, you know, straight up poppy. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, some oh, little, little, little. Uh, they little, are. Little drugs never hurt kids, right? Is that what our government's trying to say in this? But well, again, certainly you as the adult can't. An overdose. But see, nobody go, when you when somebody goes to the hospital to treat something, nobody goes. Well, I'm really going to hold against him what medicine they're giving to him, or they feel is best for his situation. That's kind of what they're doing is trying to save his life. So I don't really get involved there. But when it's in their own home, and when it's completely manageable in an adult manner, we're going to make it criminal. Like fuck you. You know, fuck your contracts, fuck your government, you're a bunch of human traffickers. I'm going to put in my body what I choose, and if you really want to fight me out on it with court, I'm just going to go to your governor's office if I really have to. I mean... Well, you know, <laughs> there's, there's an interesting thing about cannabinoids, right? You keep using that word cannabinoids. And, and they, that group of <laughs> um, compounds got its name from cannabis because cannabis has such a large number of cannabinoids. But here's the fact. A mango has cannabinoids. Deep sea creatures and plants have cannabinoids. Fact. They do. So, I mean. I try to tell people, that, like, hey, man, you think DMT should be illegal? Your body's carrying it right now. Yeah. Now what? Now what? You're a felon Everyone's now, bro. Carrying. You're a felon now, bro. Every one of us are felons because but our body all naturally. They, all they would do is say, oh, well, all we got to do is write in there that. The natural amount in your I, own body. Wait, 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 wait. I hear my inner Adam Kokesh going like, it's like we're all going to die with it in our body. Like we're like, it's coronavirus and it's Can just going to be there. Yeah, absolutely. Your yeah. It's your what, interview. What is the appropriate natural amount of Adderall? I don't, I don't, I don't know, sir. What is the appropriate level? There is Adderall? none. There uh, is none. No such thing. Uh, and Adderall is the drug they give to kids, correct? Uh, yep, that's how you get kids hooked on drugs. It works very well. But 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 again, I thought it. I, I thought it. Wait wait. Then that would imply the government is giving drugs to kids. They are. Well, I I don't think anybody's disputing that on this show. I'm just questioning, like, who disputes this stuff? Like, where are you? Like, we're right here, buddy. We're right here. here. No, the link, it, man. Like, yeah, yeah send somebody the link. Who? Wait, who? You want government? They're giving drugs to kids. I mean, honestly, like you're going to defend your government. Where, where, what, do you want the government that gives drugs to kids, or do you want the government that helps you? Well, right. our government is proven, proven. You can look this up; it's been released, proven to have tested LSD, which I'm not against, and chemical weapons, which I am against, and psychological warfare on its own people. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with you here. So, when this is something that really profounds me, and and I got to ask you this then too. So. If, if, if we're really arguing to keep a government and we know what their end result of government is, why do we still continue? I mean, what I, where I, I've asked Adam is this is a mental health disorder. If it's not a mental health disorder and we, we put that notion to the side and just say, okay, what is the actual problem? Because if we can see government's giving drugs to kids, they're keeping medicines that actually heal you illegal. They're doing things that are 
inherently against your better nature and your life, your liberties and your pursuits of happiness, but you're still fighting for that. Why? And how do we, again, advice, I guess, is really what I'm looking for, but how do we actually get that message to those people stuck in the red team or blue team? It's it's. Can, it's, can I ask you a question? Oh, answer. Uh, we'll go question for question. Yes, sir. No, I'd like to ask you two in a row. If I can. Not, you're, you're good. Have you ever eaten a Burger King? Uh, yes, of course. Have you ever seen a Burger King commercial? Yes, I have. What's the difference? Between eating at Burger King and and seeing a commercial, uh, for a Burger King, for a Burger King. Well, one is an experience at the actual location. The other one is an advertisement. You know, wherever the you're. Burger looks beautiful, them. juicy. It looks like something you want uh, to eat in the commercial. You get there and it says flat, greasy, unhealthy, disgusting. Expectation thing. versus reality. Correct. Yeah. And I like to say our government is nothing but a Burger King commercial. I'm not against that notion either, man. I'm not against it at all. I think that you're you're spot on with your analogy. But, but why do we keep doing it? The, the, the drive through at Burger King in Minot, North Dakota is going to be packed for dinner tonight. The drive through at McDonald's packed for dinner tonight. Fear and addiction. Fear and addiction. You don't have to be a drug to be addicted to it. I feel like this is a conversation Adam should have been a part of, too. <laughs> you know, I really wanted to thank him and let him know that I found my legs, too. Hey, well, um, you, you know what? Uh, why don't you uh, – I'm sure he's watching. I'm just – he's not on the show today. So, I mean, if you got anything for Adam as well, you know. I do, actually. Um, so, I finally forced the state to recognize that I do have legs. They've been firmly attached to my body since they formed in my mother's womb. Um, but now it's official because it's on a piece of paper. They actually exist because it's written down, right? <laughs> um, b- before the before that process was fixed, um, I got a hold of the paperwork and I actually made a post about it on my site. You can find it. It's a picture of my legs, and I cropped out the piece of the paperwork that said that I have feet but no legs. Um, it used to also say that I had the ability to drive with assistive technology. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Wow. Apparently, I have it's not, it's, I it's, apparently it's uh, not official until government says so. Uh, hey, uh, sir, I'm gonna hop off here, but it's a pleasure to be able to hop in here with you. And uh, I wish you luck on your campaign. And uh, I know uh, Jim here will let you close off with your site again. Uh, good luck on that. And uh, real last question for me. It's a quick one. Will I be seeing you in at the next convention in 2022? As long as I can get there. If I become senator, I will have the money to get there. Uh, well, fair enough. All right. We'll see you next time, sir. Perfect. Well, we hope to see you there. Outstanding. Yeah. Well, that was a great conversation, man. I really do appreciate you coming on. Uh, like CJ can, said, we want to give you one more opportunity to promote your page. Uh, go ahead. Well, we're we're go looking ahead for about 10000 about where, where they can campaign find ads, actually. And Facebook we need money. Work. That's the unfortunate thing. Uh, in private donations, we've been able in the month of June to outraise my opponent. Um, what does that tell you, right? That's what the people want. But here's the thing. this He's had many terms, and he has a war chest, and he will use it. Um, so I need, we need money for the campaign so that we can advertise, so that we can get hurt. Um, and maybe I can stay out of the thunderstorms a little more. I've been having to, having to wade through New York thunderstorms um, to be at events. And I like being at events, but I, I do not like having arthritic flares. <laughs> it's uh, it's wearing on me a bit. And, yeah, and a TV yeah. ad would be a much better way to get out there. And, and that is unfortunate. I personally don't like TV. I don't I don't subscribe to cable, and I don't even watch Netflix anymore. I don't have the time for it. I prefer to be busy and I prefer to do. But I want everybody out there to know that I am already working hard. I'm getting most often less than three hours of sleep a night. I'm living on caffeine. My doctor's concerned for me, uh, but I'm doing what I want to do and what I believe is the right thing to do. And it's it's hard, and we need your help. We need people to support us. You can donate on TomFor52.com, T-O-M-F-O-R-5-2.com. And, you know, we appreciate every penny. Every penny counts. Small donations are more than welcome. But if you've got more money, please give us something to really – make a difference here with uh, the people of district 52 are suffering they've been suffering for a long time and it's time to end it 
Absolutely. Outstanding. Well, I hope that I wish the best for you. I hope everybody rallies behind you. And uh, I look forward to doing another show with you in the future and hearing about some positive changes that you may have made once uh, through your race. Well, so thanks uh, again, Thomas, for joining us. We're, we're oh. making some positive changes. We're, we're getting people to listen to us. You know, I, I, I don't mean to like hold up all your time, but if I could speak to something, we were talking about the interparty. No, no worries. Interparty politics earlier. Uh, in New York, we drew heavily from the right, um, and that's good. Yeah, but it gave us some bad optics because we live in a blue state. And what I've been able to do is pull from the left as well. When we were when we were delivering yard signs last night, it was uh, a few libertarians, and the rest were 50% red and 50% blue. How else are you going to go to the party in this state if you can't talk to the left and keep your cool and help them understand that we need more options and that one solution does not fit all. It is a country of justice and liberty for all, not one solution for all. Perfectly said. And you've been making progress with that, you say, with the uh, with the left? Yes, yes. Um, actually, I had a good conversation with a Democratic community member yesterday. And I do believe I'm starting to win her support. Nice. Perfect. That's exciting, man. Well, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you get back to winning that race. And like I said, I look forward to uh, having an interview with a state senator. You know, I look forward state to that. Senator too. And, uh, if Adam wants to so talk to me, you again, call Tommy. me anytime.